brain participants and as in-person participation, as well as we have also online participants and the Deputy Minister of Indonesia and who, who wishes to attend this one. Um, probably I should speak mostly in English sometime. If necessary, I will switch back to Korean language. And we have eight panelists in the program and the beginning four panelists are pre-recorded uh, panelists. So therefore, uh, we will hear about uh, each uh, pre-recorded panelist's uh, comment and each one probably is more likely to spend four minutes. And after four panelists, uh, we will start our in-person uh, panelist comment and discussion. And I know uh, most of you, especially as in-person participants, must have prepared all your major comment point, but I would appreciate if you focus on two important or three important points as uh, related to the meaningful occasion of this celebrating 25 years foundation of Korea Ocean Ministry. The first point that I'd like you to focus on why we need integrated policy and governance. And number two, what should be the national commitment to climate change collaboration? And finally, if time allows us, what uh, should we work together? In what area we can work together for international collaboration? And in that order, if the time is too freezing out, I'd like to I'd like you to focus only the first point. Why do we need integrated policy and governance? Because some countries have introduced ministerial level governance, which are the case of Korea, Canada, Indonesia, and recent France, whereas the others are still suffering from lacking governance. So I would appreciate that one. Okay, uh, before inviting the pre-recorded panelists, I'd like to very quickly mention about our in-person participants. From my left-hand side, we have a representative from French Embassy to Korea, uh, Ms. Sandra, Ms. Sandra Cohen, and uh, very welcome you. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, please uh, give her a round of applause. <laughs> and next to her is former Korean ambassador to Fiji, uh, Mr. Song In Kim. And next to him is Dr. Hee Chol Yang, uh, head of Ocean Law and Policy Institute of Kyoto Korea Institute of Ocean Science and Technology. And last but not the least, and the representative of Korea Ocean Ministry, Mr. Yong Tae Kim, director of Marine Policy Division. And let's quickly hear about pre-recorded video. We have four uh, panelists. The first one coming from Spain, followed by Ghana, and by Peru, and finally by Mexico. So let's hear about Dr. Ricardo Haron, professor at the University of Las Palmas in Spain. Good afternoon. Thanks for the invitation to participate in this international event. It's an honor for me to share with you some insight about the marine policy and recent development in Spain, especially regarding marine spatial planning processes, taking the, as an example the waters surrounding the Canary Island. I would like to congratulate the organizer of the World Ocean Forum on the fifth edition. I think it's a very important event, and I hope my contribution will improve some of the output of this uh, event. As you may know, in the European Union, each member state has is been defining its own marine spatial planning process. Following the principle of the European DFT, which was approved in June 2014. In the case of Spain, five different uh, MSP processes have been uh, defined, covering the Cantabrian Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Balearic Island, and adjacent coastal area, as well as the Canary Islands. <coughs> Why we need marine spatial planning? As you know, the ocean are probably the last unplanned part of the Earth, and more and more activities 
are happening in the sea near our coast or even offshore with different activities. So unless we find, find out some common management, well, it will be probably it will be possible to have some conflict or maybe some problem among different users. So MSP helps to coordinate and minimize conflict as well as uh, implement current policies and apply sustainable development and ecosystem based approach for the development of these blue growth sectors. Marine spatial planning of the Canary Island. So the Canary Island is a volcanic archipelago located in the central east Atlantic Ocean near West African coast, which are large economic exclusive zone. <coughs> which is recognized internationally as a biodiversity hotspot with many uh, marine species, many marine life, rich in marine life, with, and also with some threats. I give you some numbers to, to put you in the context. Uh, these are more at the distance between the eastern and the western island for about 500 kilometers, and only a little more than 100 kilometers from the, from the African shore. We have a large uh, marine economic exclusive zone and have a, a lot of uh, people, 2 million people living in the island and <clears throat> 2 million people and about uh, 50 million of uh, tourists or visitors in the in the last uh, pre-pandemic pre year so there are many activities that are doing the coastal or maritime sectors many of them linked with the blue road so in the Equaqua Research Institute, we have been working on relevant parameters associated with the 11 descriptor of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, the European Directive for to determine the good environmental status of the of the water bodies. So we try to identify those parameters and correlate with the activities that are happening in the sea. <coughs> So, for example, through the European project, uh, we have been developing together with our colleagues in Azul and Madeira the first step of marine Spanish spatial planning processes and with the appropriate scientific and technical criteria. For example, here you see the analysis of the environmental information from the species distribution here or from the in the central part and in the in both sides there are the artisanal fisheries activities that were not uh, fully mapped in the different islands, from the former situation to the recent to the actual situation, or the whale watching activity in the right hand side side uh, as map, you can see the whale watching activity in the different islands. So that's another important sector that we have to uh, take account of. <clears throat> One of the main results of this uh, project has been the creation of a Canary Island Marine Spatial Planning Platform that is uh, based in the Equaqua Institute, where we have compiled public database, environmental and economic data, as well as, uh, that's very important, very relevant information from several meetings with diverse marine stakeholders, maritime stakeholders. We have contributed to know the constraints and synergies between the marine ecosystem and maritime use and pressures. For example, another important topic has been the mapping of major habitats and endangered marine species, either with our own data from the Coaqua in the left, from the LIFE project in the Mares in the centre, or from database our European base last uh, MUNET. So that project has been finalised, but we started in September this year. We have started together with Portugal, Spain and France a new project for the um, advancing marine spatial planning in the Azores and Madeira, the Canary Island, and also the French Guayana in the case of France. So the different institutions are collaborating to explore the major interaction of blue sectors and marine conservation at large scale. A relevant issues is the identification of the blue infrastructures for conservation, as well as, as, well as the valorization of ecosystem services that we have to take account on, on the different habitats. In addition, the analysis of the data of highly migratory species is very important, and we are considering the potential definition of novel marine protected area, including perhaps areas beyond national jurisdictions. So, like uh, 
message to take home. This is a small summary. As you know, the Spanish, as you, <coughs> the Spanish government is currently developing marine spatial planning process under the framework of the EU MSP directive. <coughs> In the marine water on the Spanish coast, there are many opportunities to develop blue growth sectors and the blue local communities with a long-term sustainability perspective, either in the maritime transport sector in the Canary Island, coastal maritime tourists, renewable marine energy, aquaculture, artisanal fisheries, etc., etc. Those are the major sectors that we are investigating. Another relevant issue is, is, the, is the valorization of the ecosystem services and the definition of marine protected areas, trying to comply not only to the Green Deal um, compromise of the European Union, but also of contribute to the um, EU decade of the oceans. So <clears throat> I will I will think that uh, the main theme of the of the World Ocean Forum is uh, the future of everything, the ocean transformation. I think this uh, this motto may also reflect the diversity of action that nations around the globe could develop and support the well-being of their blue society. Let's call that named under ecosystem-based management approach. <laughs> Therefore, I would like to thank you for your attention one more time. Congratulations for the celebration of the fifth World Ocean Forum. Gracias. Gan Samida. Okay. Thank you, Professor Haron uh, from Spain. I next the panelist is Mr. Paul Bannerman from Ghana, but uh, however, I was told that his message will be delivered by one of our staff members. Am I right? Yeah, okay. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, distinguished personalities participating in this August Forum. I am extremely happy to be part of this year's World Ocean Forum and wish to congratulate the organizers for putting together such an impressive forum in a period where global economies are still recovering from the shocks of the COVID-19 pandemic with fisheries not spread. The theme for this year's forum focuses on our oceans and it is the future of everything ocean transformation. You will all agree with me that the world's oceans have seen significant transformation. In the last decade, with the devastating impacts of climate change, resources depletion, and adverse effects on most coastal developing nations. The economic cost of piracy on our oceans within the sub-Sahara region cannot be overemphasized coupled with IUU fishing. Need I say that while these challenges have been a huge issue for governments to tackle, particularly in developing countries such as Ghana and with bilateral cooperation and help from other developed countries, including South Korea, we are thriving to improve governance structures in fisheries. Indeed, the future of everything begins with water and from the oceans. The oceans give life, well-being, incomes, livelihoods, recreations, and entertainment. The sustainability of our oceans is key for our very existence, thus we must guard and jealously. As we commemorate the 15th anniversary of the World Ocean Forum, I leave you with this thought. Let us not be like the ostrich. Let us not bury our heads in the sand and pretend we do not see what is happening to our oceans. Let us together as regional fisheries bodies, international organizations in goodwill, protect our oceans by conscientiously developing technologies that mitigate against the adverse impacts of climate change and man-made activities that impinge on the regional use of our oceans. Let us stop all forms of illegal unreported and unregulated fishing for many livelihoods depend on the oceans. Let us be mindful that we have all signed to a call to leave no one behind, the UN Agenda 2030, a call to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure everyone enjoys peace and prosperity. Thank you, and I wish we all have a fruitful deliberation in this forum that will bring transformation transformational change to our fisheries 
and posterity at large. Thank you. 감사합니다. 예, 수고하셨어요. Yes, thank you very much. The uh, pre-recorded panelist is Professor Roberto Quisquen Fernandez from National University of Callao in Peru. Buenos días para Corea. Muchas gracias por la invitación a la conmemoración del 25 aniversario de la Administración Integrada de Océanos y Pesca de Corea. Y gracias a los organizadores de este evento, el Ministerio de Océanos y Pesca de la República de Corea y la Secretaría de la WOF. Voy a empezar mi disertación indicando que el océano tiene gran influencia en el Perú, tanto así que ha modificado su clima. Además, requiere de los recursos que este proporciona. Desde hace más de 50 años, el Perú tiene pesquerías importantes. Se encuentra dentro de los 10 países que realizan el 50 por 57% de las pesquerías mundiales, como lo reporta la estadística de la FAO. Esto se explica porque nuestro mar forma parte de uno de los ecosistemas marinos más diversos y productivos del mundo. Consciente de esta realidad, el gobierno peruano, en 1947, mediante el decreto supremo 781, proclamó el dominio marítimo de 200 millas de ancho, en la que ejerce soberanía y jurisdicción. En 1952 se precisó con la ley de petróleo que el zócalo continental forma parte del territorio peruano. En 1965, con la ley de aeronáutica, se declaró que el Perú ejerce soberanía sobre el espacio aéreo que cubre su territorio y aguas jurisdiccionales. En 1969, con la ley de agua, incluye la del mar hasta las 200 millas. En el mismo año, con decreto ley 17.824, se creó el cuerpo de capitanías y guardacostas con la función, entre otras, la de policía marítima. En el 1970, con la ley 18.225, se regula el aprovechamiento de los recursos minerales del suelo y subsuelo del territorio nacional, incluyendo el zócalo continental y el fondo marino dentro de las 200 millas. En 1971, con la Ley General de Pesquería, se estableció el dominio del Estado sobre las especies hidrobiológicas contenidas en el mar jurisdiccional hasta las 200 millas. Asimismo, son muchos los sectores del Estado que están vinculados con el océano. Podemos mencionar al Ministerio del Ambiente, que interviene en la protección de especies de extinción, el Ministerio de Energía y Minas, por la explotación del petróleo en la plataforma continental, al Ministerio de Transporte y Comunicaciones, que regula el transporte marítimo, la Autoridad Nacional del Agua, que es responsable de asegurar la calidad del agua. El Ministerio de Comercio Exterior y Turismo, porque promueve diversas actividades turísticas vinculadas con el mar. La Marina de Guerra del Perú, quien asegura la soberanía del mar territorial. También debemos incluir a las autoridades locales que tienen ciudades costeras. Cada una de estas tiene fines específicos, pero no coordinan sus actividades por lo que resulta caótico sus acciones vinculadas con el mar. Entonces, el tema de la gobernanza marítima está implícito en las acciones del Estado peruano, pero enfocado en los recursos y en la soberanía, no en un océano que requiere ser gestionado con un enfoque holístico. Algunas acciones son del Estado, la regulación de la pesca de las principales especies, aún no de la mayoría. La creación en el presente año de la Reserva Nacional Dorsal de Nazca, siendo la primera área protegida netamente marina del país. También se han emitido otras normas menores, pero aún con impactos muy limitados. En conclusión, se entiende la necesidad de una gobernanza del mar peruano, pero sus acciones son desarticuladas porque no existe una unidad que las integre. Estas acciones son fraccionadas, limitadas y utilitaristas. 
Las medidas de protección contra la pandemia del COVID-19 que sufrió el país lo llevó a su paralización, incluyendo sus políticas y acciones que iban por el camino de la adecuada gobernanza del mar peruano. Un año y medio después, se está saliendo ya de esta parálisis, pero las acciones del Estado están centradas en resolver sus problemas urgentes, vinculados a cubrir las necesidades básicas. Se espera que siga creciendo el interés en la gobernanza del océano para que se conviertan en política de Estado. Respecto a la cooperación coreana, el CONAT ha desarrollado proyectos enfocados en la comunidad pesquera artesanal y en el consumo humano directo de la anchoveta. Se viene realizando el estudio de la acuicultura en la selva peruana, así como un estudio de factibilidad para instalar un centro de entrenamiento acuícola en el, un distrito del Brain con la ayuda de la cooperación coreana. Gracias. Thank you very much uh, for his unexpectedly he was speaking in Spanish and it was only translated into Korean by channel three. If you switch to other channel number, you might have overheard other sessions translation. And uh, to summarize what he spoke, uh, spoke in English, uh, uh, they are suffering from the no existing integrated governance, and uh, he also introduced some the Korea joint collaboration project, especially on artisanal fishing community, anchovy uh, aquaculturing, as well as establishment of aquaculture training center uh, for capacity building in Peru. Okay, uh, the final pre-recorded panelist is uh, another professor, Gustavo Rodriguez from Uh, Fashimar UAS University in Mexico. ¿Qué tal? Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Gustavo Rodríguez. Soy profesor investigador de la Facultad de Ciencias del Mar de la Universidad Autónoma de Sinaloa en Mazatlán, México. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Y bueno, esto es un pequeño resumen de, de la participación a nombre de la facultad. Eh, dentro de los tres conceptos importantes a manejar, pues está todo esto del de potencial que tiene México de sumarse a los esfuerzos internacionales, de apegarse a los lineamientos y criterios de la eh, Revolución Azul. Eh, nosotros tenemos 10.000 kilómetros de zonas cost, eh, de litorales costeros en México con una gran biodiversidad y pues pesquerías industriales bastante importantes, sobre todo eh, para camarón y muchas especies de peces. Una de ellas es el atún de aleta amarilla. Todo esto, eh, pues dentro de lo posible, ha permitido cierta colaboración con instancias internacionales, sobre todo europeas y de eh, otros países de, del continente americano, más que nada por el hecho de el grado de comercialización de estos productos, pero también la relación de parte de esos recursos son compartidos, ya que tienen patrones migratorios y por lo tanto, pues hay explotaciones en diferentes lugares y por lo tanto, pues poner algunos criterios para tratar de ser un poco más sostenibles en su manejo. Como tal, pues gran parte de las políticas de uso y extracción de recursos en la zona costera pues eh, a nivel de, del uso de, de, la, de, la, eh, de la zona litoral depende sobre todo de la Secretaría del Medio Ambiente y de la Secretaría de Marina, pero lo que se refiere al, al manejo propiamente hablando de, de recursos pesqueros que únicamente cae en lo que es el Instituto Nacional de Pesca y Acuacultura, que es la parte de investigación, son el grupo de personas especializadas que participan en colaboración con sobre todo universidades eh, eh, que, trabaja, que trabajan en el área para establecer criterios de veda de, varias, de muchas de las especies. Nosotros tenemos cartas acuícolas nacionales y pesqueras que nos dictan cuáles son las especies sujetas a explotación o a captura para las cuales se emiten permisos, y, eh, pero todo esto pues recae quién va a ser la, la instancia regulatoria y de vigilancia, en este caso la Comisión Nacional de acuacultura y pesca en la CONAPESCA. Desafortunadamente ambas eh, instancias han eh, sufrido recientemente muchos programas, eh, recortes de presupuesto eh, debido a los programas de austeridad republicana del gobierno 
eh, federal que, te, que está en, en este momento en, en México y se ha perdido mucho de esa vigilancia que se tenía de gran parte de los programas que ya se estaban implementando con anterioridad. El caso más reciente pues es la pérdida de la certificación para la exportación de camarón de mar hacia Estados Unidos debido a que se suspendió el uso de excluidores de tortugas en las redes de arrastre. Se acaba de hacer un esfuerzo muy importante en el cual participó la facultad desde el punto de vista de facilitar instalaciones para volver a capacitar a los pescadores en el uso de estos excluidores, pero esto es un caso aislado. Eh, se necesita ampliarse el alcance de estos programas e inclusive mejorar eh, o implementar nuevas estrategias de pesca de especies de este tipo que sean más amigables con el medio ambiente y poder cumplir con estos conceptos de la Revolución Azul. De todo esto, pues eh, definitivamente el hecho de poder ampliar esta red de colaboraciones y dentro de lo, eh, de lo posible en el corto y mediano plazo, poder establecer un convenio de colaboración con el Instituto Marítimo de Corea, pues definitivamente abre una puerta a posibilidades muy interesantes, sobre todo de apoyar estos instancias de gobierno desde el punto de vista como universidades públicas que, que somos, precisamente para modificar y actualizar muchos de esos criterios de pesca de partes de estas especies, entre, entre otros. Además de también ser mucho más cuidadosos o implementar eh, programas más efectivos en lo que se refiere a el posible uso de cambio de de suelo en estas zonas costeras, sobre todo pues que el, dado que el turismo, aunado a otras actividades extractivas como es el petróleo y gas, pues están en amplia competencia con lo que se refiere a lo que es el cuidado de, del medio ambiente en estas zonas. Entonces, esperamos poder tener la oportunidad de colaborar con el KMI y de esta manera pues poder eh, hacer llegar a nuestros colegas en México nuevos criterios para el manejo de estos recursos que compartimos en los océanos. Muchas gracias. Uh, yes. Like the previous speaker, there was no translation into English, only for Korean translation. And watching uh, Sandra's expression, I guess you could understand what he spoke. If so, probably I, I shouldn't translate this one into English, but for Indonesian deputy minister, his major point was uh, divided governance between Ministry of uh, Environment and Ocean, whereas the major res official resources was regulated, monitored by the National Fisheries Research Institution uh, through National Fisheries Committee. However, recent budget has been cut, and their major species focus is squid but recent squid export to U.S. was uh, halted because the, the turtle was caught as bycatch, so therefore their export to U.S. market was closed. And uh, to cooperate with Korea, and they like to work together to formulate uh, some policy how to regulate uh, fishery resources. Okay, uh, thank you for the four panelists. Now we start with our in-person uh, panelist uh, discussion, starting from uh, Sandra Cohen from French Embassy. Let's welcome uh, Ms. Sandra Cohen by a round of applause. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me today to this very meaningful e event and uh, congratulations on the anniversary. Uh, so let me start by giving a piece of context of background information on uh, France integrated uh, administration. But uh, first of all, I will start with a brief overview of France maritime assets. Um, as you know, France is a maritime nation since 15th century, uh, but actually uh, it's our Royal Navy in the 17th century who contributed to opening trade routes. And in the 18th century, we were a major maritime country. But our relation to the sea has evolved over the time. And uh, even though today our relation to the sea is still very strong, uh, we, only had, um, we only created our Ministry of the Sea last year. Actually, I should say we recreated a Ministry of the Sea last year because we had a Ministry of the Sea in 1981 and 1988. So 
it's always surprising when I say that France is a maritime nation because our waters cover 11 million square kilometers. Uh, it is 20 times our country's own area. And our exclusive economic zone is the second largest in the world. We also have uh, presence in every ocean except the Arctic Ocean. We are present in the North Sea, Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean. We have uh, an excellent uh, pioneering oceanographic research uh, institutes that everybody knows, like IFREMER, IPEV. We have 66 ports, 32 million tourists going through our ports, and yet we didn't have a Ministry of the Sea. So what changed, actually? Uh, in, um, I think it comes with a general awareness of the importance of maritime cooperation and maritime importance. So, um, of course, uh, in most countries, maritime issues concern several ministries, like agriculture, environment, diplomacy, of course, uh, army, trade, of course. But uh, in 2019, the French president uh, has given a very ambitious roadmap to develop France as an ocean oceanic power. And uh, creating the Ministry of the Sea was a great signal uh, given regarding our ambition. Uh, so what does this ministry do, actually? It is responsible for many, many different policies. I will not give too many details because we don't have time. But uh, everything that is related to navigation, safety, training, a seafarer, boating, a marine space pla planning, as our um, uh, Spanish colleague mentioned, and when it comes to fisheries, of course, it uh, overlaps with the Ministry of Agriculture. Together, they're supervised underwater resources. And when it comes to transport and protection of marine environment, uh, the ministry works with the Ministry of Ecological Transition. So there are good synergies uh, within every government. But yet, it is important to have a Ministry of the Sea to supervise and uh, I would like to quote, actually, our Minister of the Sea, uh, Madame Annick Girardin, when she said, actually, I should have an interlocutor in every maritime country, because this is helpful to develop a good international dialogue. It is uh, um, helpful to compare notes and uh, to entertain a political dialogue on major issue. So, um, uh, just one word on our objectives. Um, uh, France is highly committed, of course, to the blue economy, and it's in line with the, uh, what was explained earlier on the European Union blue uh, growth. But uh, um, there is one specific goal that we have, is to um, project our influence as a maritime nation, because we, are, um, we have a geostrategic geo involvement. Uh, because we want to participate to a sustainable management and to use the, o the ocean as a channel of communication. So the basic idea is that we must politically deliver a strong message. And the pres French president Emmanuel Macron said that before being a space of competition between states, because the ocean can be a space of competition, before being a channel for exchange of good, be, before being inspirations for artists and poets, the ocean is a common good of humanity. And this is to answer your second question, uh, Professor Chang. Uh, I think that what we can do together is to join forces to uh, do outreach and explain at the international level how important the ocean uh, resources is. So I think I will stop now and uh, would like to thank you very much for your time. Thank you. From your official position, I thought you were just political counselor, but you turned out to be an actual maritime attaché. Okay. Uh, yes, congratulations, your new establishment of Ministry of the Sea. Okay, and the remaining three panelists are all Korean, so depending upon your preference, you can either choose Korean language or English. Uh, you can choose. And Ambassador Kim? You are the next. Yes. 
Professor Chang, who is moderating this session, and also Mr. Song sang from the MOF, and all the organizers of this forum. I am very pleased to participate in this meaningful forum, which celebrates the 25th anniversary of the integrated marine management of Korea, as I have been working as the ambassador of Fiji and ambassador of five island countries. I have felt many things. So today, I want to take this as an opportunity to share that with you. First, I think the role of the Ministry of Ocean and Fisheries in the Southern Pacific region can be summarized into four points. First, it was able to establish the largest fishing base in the world. We have 21 fishing bases in this region, and we have many vessels in the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean and the Southern Ocean. And more than 50% of tuna that we are importing is from the Southern Pacific Sea. And this is how the this region is important to Korea. And secondly, in Southern Pacific region, in an area called Chuk, we created a marine outpost. And here, using this marine outpost, we have been conducting marine research and development on black pearl, oysters, and so on. And we were able to register many patents and sharing research results with other countries as well. So the performance of this marine outpost in Chuk is very good. And thirdly, I want to talk about, well, this can be a domestic problem, but in Tunga and in Fiji, there are lots of rare minerals. And for the past decade, we have been exploring these minerals in the submarine hydrothermal system in this area. Of course, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a suspension. But starting from the end of this year or early next year, we are going to start the drilling work together with a company called KOC of Korea. And fourth, I want to talk about the OTEC in Kiribati. Uh, OTEC stands for Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion. Then why Kiribati? We have four seasons in Korea, but this is a region where there is only summer. So the temperature in the sea is very high, and that is why we are able to conduct ocean thermal, thermal power generation. And we will be able to supply electricity using this power generation and also supply water. And that means we can build factories using this electricity and water resources, and this can lead to many jobs creation, a creation of many new jobs. And I've been working here for more than four years. I have met the president of Kiribati and many high ranking officials in this area. And most of the message that they deliver is that because of the aggravation of climate change, the countries in this Pacific area are suffering the lack of water resources or the lack of fresh water, and this is leading to waterborne diseases. And they want to borrow the technologies of Korea to promote the growth of power generation industry and also to protect the environment in this area. Not one person mentioned this. Officials from Kiribati and Nauru and Tuvalu 
all emphasize this importance of technology transfer from Korea. So this is the message that I would like to deliver to the Ministry of Ocean and Fisheries. I think the ministry has to contribute to the international community more. When it comes to the issue of giving ODA, of course, there are also bilateral ODA agreements to develop, for example, distant water fishery. But we have 14 countries in this southern Pacific area, and we need to come up with a broad-based or comprehensive ODA package for this region. So in the short term, we have to expand this ODA package. And in the long term, I hope that the Ministry of Ocean and Fisheries can take the lead in expanding the ODA to these countries. And there are challenges such as water resource shortage, electricity shortage, and the level of sea rise in these island countries in Southern Pacific. And the MOF has many maritime technologies that they can use to address these problems faced by these small island countries in Southern Pacific. Especially, I think the provision of OTEC can be useful in addressing problems such as the lack of water resources, the lack of electricity, and other natural challenges. And this will ultimately be a win-win proposition for both sides because we have the need to purchase carbon credit to meet the carbon cap. And by providing OTEC, we can secure carbon credit and they can be a win-win to Korea as well. And one last suggestion that I would like to make as we have representatives from the MOF here in this forum. Well, we have a very good facility in Chuk. But because this base or the marine outpost in Chuk is located in a peripheral area, the awareness of this outpost is very low. So I hope to establish a sub-branch of the Chuk outpost in the capital of Micronesia and other marine cooperation center can be probably established in Fiji, uh, which can bring together experts from KMI, Kiosk, and Criso. So I think through these facilities and centers, we can share the technologies and information of Korea with other countries, and that could lead to greater contribution from Korea to other countries. That is the end of my remarks. Yes, thank you very much. Again, I uh, think that we were able to uh, feel the passion that you have. Um, for uh, different programs and projects, and uh, indeed, I have a lot of insight into uh, the issues of marine affairs. Thank you very much uh, for your input. Uh, next, I would like to invite over Mr. Yang He Chul. He is uh, currently the head of Ocean Law and Policy Institute at uh, Korea Institute of Ocean Science and Technology. Yes, uh, good afternoon. I am Yang Hee Chul from Kyost. Uh, when, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, the uh, successful hosting of 2021 uh, World Ocean Forum. And uh, again, I think that this is very meaningful as we commemorate the 25th anniversary of integrated um, marine administration. Today, I think that I was able to learn a lot of uh, insights pertaining to this matter and uh, from the EU, Indonesia, and uh, Taiwan recently, I believe, uh, set up um, a body for integrated uh, marine management in uh, China also, although there were some uh, changes, um, still has uh, an integrated marine ad administration. So in the, the Northeast Asian region, when it comes to marine affairs, I think that uh, we will see more accelerated uh, integrated administration. With regard to uh, marine and fisheries uh, integrated administration during the past 25 years, I think that um, on and off, uh, there were calls uh, for the establishment and also uh, shutdown of uh, the Ministry of 
oceans and uh, fisheries. Some even say that uh, it uh, oscillated uh, like uh, a watch. Now, I think that we have to think about um, the effects of integrated administration, dispersed administration, and uh, having no administration at all. I think that uh, we never had a comprehensive review on that matter. I think that uh, most of the initiatives uh, were taken up uh, by the political circle. So I think that when it comes to integrated administration, there indeed are a lot of merits, and therefore it's something that we need to push forward with going forward. Earlier, uh, Dr. Park Kwang Seo delivered a very insightful presentation, and I also learned a lot from the presentation. When it comes to um, marine and fisheries, I think that uh, through integrated administration, uh, we were able to see many successful outcomes uh, on top of everything that uh, was shared uh, by Dr. Park Kwang Seo. I think that institutionally, there were also many noteworthy achievements. I think that in the past, uh, coastal management uh, was the focus. However, now uh, we see Arctic, Antarctic, um, and also deep sea, and also open sea projects. And thanks to uh, this integrated uh, marine and fisheries administration. And I think that uh, Korea ranks uh, world's number 10th when it comes to its marine and fisheries industries. And thanks to its uh, integrated administration, um, um, I think that uh, we were able to propose uh, legislative bills at the ministry, and uh, the ministry also has the authority and power to coordinate different policies and initiatives at the government level. Uh, I think that uh, we also have to look at uh, logistical aspects and also the exploration opportunities available. I talked about in Antarctic and also Arctic and deep sea uh, projects. Russia, China, and Korea also have uh, deep sea resources that we can explore. So I think that integrated administration can be very helpful in uh, continuing on with those exploration activities. And uh, I believe that uh, since the inception of uh, the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries, East Sea, West Sea, and also uh, South Sea, I think that we were able to see many fisheries-related agreements and also joint uh, oil and uh, natural gas exploration uh, agreements. And I think that it was thanks to having an integrated administration. When it comes to uh, marine policies, as Dr. Brown mentioned earlier, I think that having an integrated administration uh, means that we can set up mid to long-term policies. And uh, when it comes to fisheries, uh, trading, mechanism improvements, I think that uh, integrated administration uh, played an important role. Of course, uh, there were some downsides. Um, there indeed uh, were some of the um, results uh, that uh, were not beneficial. For example, marine pollution and also uh, marine debris. When it comes to those uh, challenges, I think that uh, we still have to work out how better the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries can work with other agencies and government ministries. We talked about uh, Korea Meteorological Office, uh, the Ministry of um, Agriculture and Forestry, Ministry of Environment. I believe that uh, some delineation of their responsibilities and roles uh, need to be worked out. I think that. Uh, the um, the reviews that uh, Korea gets when it comes to its uh, marine uh, integrated administration is higher and better compared to um, the reviews uh, in appreciation from uh, internally. And I believe uh, that having an integrated administration when it comes to marine and fisheries um, industries uh, has been very uh, fruitful. And looking back, I think that uh, there are some areas uh, that required further improvements going forward. Uh, and I'd like to cite one example. Uh, we have Mr. Song with us uh, from MOF. And the reason uh, why MOF uh, was established uh, was because of Oncros. So how are we going to manage uh, the open sea and offshore uh, was the primary reason uh, why we put together this uh, integrated administration. 
However, uh, during the past 25 years, my apologies. Uh, we uh, still have um, two more people waiting uh, after you, and also we need to hear from our speakers. So please wrap up. So in 2018, we were able to uh, see some uh, movements uh, related to MSP. And uh, for the first time uh, at the MOF level, I think that we were able to see some management uh, over maritime spatial planning. But uh, bef prior to that, I think that uh, MOF was not able to um, play a central role. Other government ministries would make the decisions, and then the MOF uh, would uh, simply implement uh, those policies and initiatives. So going forward, um, do we have to maintain this integrated administration? Again, my apologies. Um, I have to close um, the session. So Mr. Yang, please wrap up. And we still have um, Mr. Kim Yong-tae from MIMOF, uh, and he hasn't speaking, spoken yet. So, Mr. Kim? Yes, thank you. My name is Kim Yong-tae. I am the Director of Marine Policy Division of the Ministry of Ocean and Fisheries. First, I would like to thank all the participants who took interest in participating in this marine policy session that was first established this year. I was able to learn a lot through the presentations of many speakers. Creating value added through the ocean and conducting integrated administration of marine policy well, I think many countries are all implementing similar policies. And even though different countries have different policies, I think there are lots of common grounds. Especially, I was able to find many common grounds with the United States through the presentation made by the participant from NOAA, NOAA's National Ocean, National Ocean Service. and. He mentioned that the U.S. administration has realized that the government has been neglecting the importance of ocean in mitigating the effects of climate change. So I think there is this consensus in Korea as well. And I hope that we can share experiences of countries through this forum that will be held today and also tomorrow. And I think there are other countries that are conducting integrated administration of marine policy. And I think there are also countries that are interested in this integrated administration. And I hope we could establish a cooperation mechanism between these countries. And I hope that a platform can be established so as to foster cooperation among these countries. With that, I would like to finish my remarks. Yes, thank you very much for that concluding remarks. Baru Hundin, the Deputy Minister of Indonesia, is waiting for his chance to make a comment. As the time is already running out, we are behind the schedule. Uh, would you make very quick comment or? Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Chang. Uh, first, I would like, I'm pleased to present Indonesia. Thank you for your invitation. It's a great uh, moment for us also. And this is the moment when World Ocean Forum talking about the marine policy. So many policy, every country has marine policy. So if we need something to integrate it, and then each, each country can uh, together, join together, like what we have done now with the Korea, we call it now a Marine Technology Cooperation Research Center, MTCRC. Uh, last three weeks, the, our minister, uh, Luhut, coordinator Minister Maritime Affairs and Defense, and all signed an agreement with the Minister uh, Ocean and Fisheries, uh, for Dr. Moon, uh, in Jakarta. Some of the uh, activity is a part of the what you call it, uh, uh, how to the, uh, support the Indonesian ocean policy. When we talk in ocean policy, let me uh, talking about a little bit about the Indonesian uh, by. Uh, bio, uh, sorry, uh, we're talking about the value economy in Indonesian ocean policy. When we start talking this one, if we see uh, 
uh, French and we're talking about the Peru and other Spain. We're talking about everyone talking about space po uh, marine policy, talking about the mar mar marine spatial planning. We're talking uh, that, that about the fisheries. We're talking also about how to manage the, their, their, their EEZ. This is important. When we're talking this one, Indonesia also proposed in this area, as you know, Indonesia is one of the, the second longest line across country, but in mariculture, we just provide about 1.2% of the long, long, uh, long uh, side of the coastal side of Indonesia. And in the fisheries, capture fisheries, we now has the new program, what we call it measured fisheries activities. It means we count about the input and output of the fish. We cannot catch as much as possible, no, but now we have to count it in the quota. This is part of how to control, we call it major fisheries activities. And uh, from 11 uh, fisheries management area, you know, we just count one is management, our fish management area to be considered like a spawning drone. It's, it means it's, it's, it's uh, limited forbidden for catch this area because we understood this area is spawning drone for some species tuna like yellowfin tuna and other, other species. Let's say, uh, let's talking about the Indonesian, uh, Indonesian policy. If you're talking about the, uh, what you call it uh, in the spatial, uh, the medium term national development in 2024, BSA, our government at least uh, formulated three main strategies, including marine and fisheries industry and uh, development. And the second is marine ecosystem management. And the third is across sector support as the key to achieve the economic target. This is important why we say because our Indonesian ocean policy is now is uh, until the, the, the valid until 2024. So why there is task force now under the Minister of the Minister of Maritime Affairs to, uh, to prepare for the, our ocean policy for 2045. The 2025 is clear. In 2045, we have something that the division is we decide in races become the center of the Excuse world. Excuse me, Dr. Farondin, I have to stop you yes. right now because our next, year, next session already has been behind the schedule. And okay. I, I know you have a lot to say. And as you mentioned, our minister visited Indonesia meeting your minister, Lohut, last week. Yeah. And also yes. our, I have right here, uh, our deputy minister, your counterpart of ocean ministry. So you guys get together later on uh, to Thank discuss you. about what collaboration we need. And I need to make a closing remark uh, because the time is too much <laughs> running out. Uh, thank you for all the speakers and the panelists for excellent presentation as well as active participation. I know the audience has been waiting uh, all day long, but uh, because of time limit, I cannot give the floor to the audience. But however, anytime our door should be open and we can be accessible uh, after session. Thank you very much indeed. We close the session. Okay.